This week, Richard Hammond tries to explain why the new BMW 3 Series is a little too perfect. Mike Rutherford on the minimalist joys of the Lotus Elise. Howard Stapleford on the gasoline direct injection revolution. And Chris Goffey takes out an Amazon for a date on Motor Week. Perfection. It might be the morning sun caught in the dew on a spider's web, fresh fallen snow, or a baby rabbit playing by a stream. Perfection. It means different things to different people, but the basic ingredients of your basic perfection, if you like, could be seen to be completeness. Everything there, nothing wrong, no flaws whatsoever. There's a problem with that, is it's boring. There's no story. For instance, Watership Dan would never have made it as a story if it had been about a load of bunnies leading happy-go-lucky, perfect bunny lives. No, some of them had to get splattered before we really had any interest in it. And the same goes for other images of perfection. There has to be a flaw to make it interesting. The sun is only reflected in the dew for a few hours, and then the dew's gone. That's what makes it so special. And the only interest in fresh fallen snow lies in being the first one to run through it in your wellies. Perfection of any sort needs to have flaws to make it interesting to us. And the same thing goes for cars. This is a car so good at what it does, so capable, it's almost boring. Think of Michael Schumacher, another boringly capable German. In fact, a man so in control that the wildest thing he's ever seen to do is perform the famous Schumacher jump, a leap in the air off a podium when he's just hurtled to victory in the latest Grand Prix. A jump in the air, eh? Go wild, man. Heroes and heroines of history have always shown themselves to have some sort of flaw, to be fallible in some way. We like that. We like fallible. So, what to say about this? Well, back to the fallen snow, really, lying there all perfect and untouched. The only thing we can do is run through it in our wellies. So, there have to be faults somewhere. Four point six seconds. That's very fast. Oh, I don't like this. It's all round. It'll be here somewhere. Nope. And the back's. Nope. Ah. Oh, and this seat, it's really. It's really comfy, actually. Ah, electric sunroof. Oh, one touch button, eh? Hmm. And this steering wheel, it's so. Well, it's leather. Yeah, I bet there's no legroom in the back. There's loads of legroom in the back. Ah, got it. BMW say that every nut and bolt for this new 3 Series is new. Apart, that is, from the sump plug. Well, that's just shoddy. Shabby and sloppy. Using outdated technology. I mean, it was the same sump plug as the last model. Which is not right, is it? In fact, it's near impossible to find anything overtly and outstandingly negative or wrong with this car at all. It's neither over nor underpowered. Neither does it show any signs of being particularly prone to drinking heavily. Even this, which is the thirstiest of all, the 2.8 litre straight six engine version, returns a very respectable 31 mpg. The pricing is tediously sensible as well. It's not cheap, but then neither is it expensive. You get what you pay for. Quality. The 318i starts at launch at £19,500, rising to £27,500 for this, the 328i SE. But it's worth that much of anybody's money. OK, slightly more than the last 3 Series, but then the car is bigger in all directions and you actually get more equipment. So work it out and it makes sense as well. But nothing too drastic. All still very, very sensible. It's no surprise that it's a great drive. The body shell has been stiffened for this new version, which does improve the handling, but to be honest, it was fantastic anyway on the old 3 Series. There's so much technology on board surrounding you in here that really press the wrong button at the wrong moment and you could accidentally launch a satellite. And you could also think that perhaps BMW believe that the first thing you and I are going to do when we slide behind the wheel of this thing is throw it through the nearest hedge. So much of the technology on board here is devoted to keeping everything 
pointing in the right direction. So we've got ABS and ASC plus T, which is Automatic Stability Control and Traction, a system for reducing wheel spin, together with CBC, cornering brake control, another enhancement to the braking system. This uses computer simulations to determine transverse acceleration from signals sent out by the four ABS sensors, and then boost brake pressure accordingly to correct oversteer. Basically, that means if you hit the brakes mid-corner, the system should help keep everything pointing the way you intended. So if your ABS, ASC and CBC drop you in a you-know-what, there's always your DSC to fall back on. Dynamic Stability Control. It can actually reduce the power from the engine and apply the brakes to individual wheels to restore stability if it detects that things are going a tad wonky. Oh, and then there's TPC, Tire Pressure Control. So if the car suffers a loss of tire pressure, uh, there's a little light to let us know. So ABS, ASC plus T, CBC, DSC and TPC. And the side airbags are ITS, the immobiliser is the EWS, there's an AIC control rain sensor on the wipers, and noise from the 1.9 engine is reduced by 10 dB. Oh, and the bulbs have all been replaced by LED. Actually, the various traction control and technical gizmos do work incredibly well, as is demonstrated the first time you get a bit smart and switch it off, and really only then do you realise just how much the system was doing to make you look good. This car raises a question, just how good do we want our cars to be? And in my opinion, I reckon about this good really. It is so competent, so good at what it does, that when you get out of it, you don't really want to run into the pub and talk to your mates about some outstanding feature. It simply does its job, gets on with it quietly, and does it extremely well. So well in fact, that you really could forget all about it and leave it to it really. Oh, hang on a second, I knew there was something. In the mid-1970s, Toyota first imported the Land Cruiser to the UK. It was a big, tough, rough, brutal device that looked as though it could absorb the worst the Amazon rainforest or the dust of the Sahara could throw at it. Since then, it's evolved, like the 4x4 market, into the £40,000 Amazon, today's incarnation. Ever since they started building 4x4s, Toyota have built up a formidable reputation worldwide in markets that were traditionally the preserve of Land Rover. Why? Well, even though they were just as tough as the Solihull opposition, they were reliable. That contrasted sharply with Land Rover who were criminally starved of investment and development during the 70s and 80s and Toyota simply walked into so many markets in Africa, Australia and the Middle East. Tragic, really. Now we're here in southern Spain to see exactly how the new Amazon goes. First that name. Now I always thought there was a Volvo Amazon in the 60s, a tough old saloon car. Turns out Volvo never registered the name. Silly old Volvo. Now new to the Land Cruiser range is this 4.7 litre V8 twin overhead camshaft petrol engine developing 230 brake horsepower, though why anybody should buy it is beyond me because on the urban cycle it delivers only 12 miles to the gallon and in this day and age I think that's unacceptable. It must have been built for the American market where petrol is still ridiculously cheap by world standards. Uh, I think for someone who wants to buy this sort of car that sort of thing is further down their list of priorities. If fuel economy is more important to you you will buy a different sort of car, you will buy you know, perhaps a Lexus or a BMW because it will be more fuel efficient and I think that's, that's the point about choice, people want to have 
uh, different things as a priority for them and if someone wants a big off-roader which is also luxurious this is the sort of thing for them. Many people may want something smaller in which case there's other things on the market. So why would anybody buy this vehicle against a, a faster and probably better riding big executive saloon like a BMW or a Mercedes? After all, everyone who makes these sort of cars will admit to you that 90% of them never even get their tyres muddy, let alone go seriously off-road. If the tyres do get muddy, it's usually from the car park at Ascot or Twickenham. But if you paid £40,000 for an off-road vehicle, owners demand, even if they're never going to do this sort of thing, that the vehicle really must perform. And with the huge torque of the turbo diesel and the petrol models, these Land Cruisers don't disappoint. The trouble with such a huge expanse of bonnet is that when you get to the crest of a hill you can't see what's on the other side until that area of metal dips and then you can see the road. Well not the most challenging of cross-country courses I've ever been on but nonetheless very effective performance here from the Land Cruiser. This is certainly no King's Road softy cruiser. Land cruisers are very popular and relied on in outback parts of the world like Australia and the Far East where they're almost virtually the only one that's there and in those markets people praise it simply because they know it's going to last and nothing's going to let them down. That's part of the image we have here and I think it just helps distinguish us from some of the competition as well. Now one of the key features of these new Land Cruisers is the refinement. It really is extraordinary. But uh, I've discovered that the team responsible for the Lexus with its industry class leading standards of noise and vibration suppression have been at work on this car. Inside the detail finish is very good. Hand stitched leather, lots of lovely walnut. Great big central oddments box between the seats in the top, the inevitable drinks holders and an oddments tray. And then under that, a huge storage area and the CD multiplayer unit. And down here, yet another drink storage. You must drink a lot in Land Cruisers. So there it is, the Toyota Land Cruiser Amazon. Quite extraordinary levels of refinement and silence inside for a big rough tough 4x4. If they built a Lexus with four-wheel drive, well it wouldn't be far off this. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a ridiculous hat, but when it's as cold as this and you're in the wilds of Norfolk as we are, you need this protective gear. And what do, we, what do you need it for? Because we're about to drive this, the fabulous Lotus Elise. It's a car that's been on sale for a while now, but it's a car that has an 18 month waiting list currently, sells for about 22,000 pounds, and it's been described as the greatest sports car in the world for the money. Is it? Well, we'll be telling you whether that's the case or not. And we'll also be looking at the Elise's new surprise, Big Brother. Well, it might only have Rover's modest K-Series engine, but uh, it all depends what that engine is powering. And what it's powering is a super light chassis, a glorious, glorious car that really, for hacking around a country lane on a Sunday afternoon, is there anything better for the money? Absolutely not. Forget about your MGFs, your BMW Z3s. This is the best. 
And I just love the imagination and daring that they've shown with this, this dashboard. They've torn up the raw book really, and they've started from scratch. Lovely little touches, sort of minimalist interior. And what this is, is a lesson to all those big companies out there that you can be daring with interiors, you can do things differently. Renault did it with the Spider, and Lotus have done it also with the Elise. The difference is, this is the best dashboard of its type on any car I've ever seen. This is the bit I hate, handing the car back. We've enjoyed our 12 hours with the Lotus Elise, but it's time for it to go. Was it better than I thought it would be? Absolutely. Forget about your MGFs and your BMW Z3s. This, in driver's terms, is the best 20 grand-ish sports car on the market. I just hope the build quality is as good as the driving experience. <laughs>
but because the fuel has been injected directly into the cylinder, it has like a cooling effect, which basically means much better volumetric efficiency, which gives you more power, more air that can go into the engine. The GDI engine differs significantly from its predecessors in one important respect. Both fuel injection and the mixing of fuel and air occur inside the cylinder. The fact that petrol is injected directly into the cylinder enables precise control over the amount of fuel burnt and the timing of injection. And the advantages are fuel efficiency, comparable to a conventional lean burn petrol engine, more power than a conventional petrol engine, and cleaner emissions than any other engine currently available commercially. The GDI engine's ability to deliver high power and fuel efficiency derives from the fact that it operates in two distinct combustion modes. Under normal conditions, such as when you're driving in the city or cruising on the motorway, when power requirements are minimal, the GDI engine operates in ultra-lean combustion mode, which gives you fuel efficiency equal to that of a diesel engine. Now, when you need power to accelerate or pass another vehicle on the motorway, for example, the GDI engine switches automatically to superior output mode, giving you the power and responsiveness only available from a petrol engine. Now, this isn't a unique system, is it? No, a lot of other manufacturers are trying it or have tried it. Uh, Toyota, they've also got one in Japan. Um, Audi have also got one, but I think they're only in their like trial periods. There. This is the world's first in production. So is this a problem that's solved now or is it technology that will develop further? Uh, certainly will develop further. Um, Mitsubishi are looking into ways of improving GDI. Uh, we have various models being launched in the future with GDI. Uh, we hope by the year 2001 all models will be available with gasoline direct injection. OK, Darren, thanks a lot. See you again sometime. So there we have it. Driving the Mitsubishi Charisma GDI means that you're being propelled by an extremely clever piece of design and technology. You're being nicer to the environment you're saving loads on fuel, but best of all, says GDI on the back, doesn't it? Cool.